find. So last week we did uh, symmetric key uh, in encryption. And this week we're going to look at an important area of, uh, of hashing and uh, max. So the core of what we're going to look at, and we're trying to look at the fundamentals, uh, and we'll look at the practical element in, in the lab. So we're going to look at the different types of, of hashing methods that, uh, that, that we actually have. And then again, we're going to look back at uh, salting. So last week we saw that salting allows you to add salt to uh, a key and then produce an output which will, will change. So it overcomes problems of copying and pasting uh, and, and so on. And we'll see the importance of it in, in this uh, topic in that we overcome the problem of brain rotating. So a few years ago, it wasn't too difficult for someone to break a hash because all they did was to download a massive rainbow table with virtually every single hash password that's possible. That kind of time is, is, is gone, and that most of the times what we have is, uh, is, is a salt added to our hash value. Unfortunately, the salt value is stored beside uh, the hash. <coughs> Salt value is stored beside the hash, uh, which means that an intruder can easily pop the salt off and then go through a dictionary attack of brute force. In terms of speed, which one do you think is the fastest? Dictionary or brute force? Which one would you go to probably first? Dictionary. Dictionary is going to be much faster, and most of the times you can pick off from a dictionary. Uh, the correct uh, password for the hash plus the salt. And we'll find that Hashcat has a whole lot of rules that are fairly well optimized for taking a base value and then to make the first letter uppercase, the last one a number, and to add. Or we can tag it on eight characters uh, and look for set, set patterns. So at the end, uh, we'll do some Hashcat rules and try and understand how Hashcat the performance, because what we will need to do is understand how, if we were to hash uh, passwords, how long would it take an intruder to be able to crack uh, those, those, those passwords. And then, uh, as we'll find, uh, one of the weakest things in, a, in hashed values is when you create a collision. That causes a lot of problems, because you might have two images been asked, for those two images, is it possible to create the same hashed value? And in the case of MD5, it's not that difficult. On all your computers here, you could probably create two images with the same hash value in a reasonable amount of time. In fact, as we'll see, you can create three, someone has created three images with the same MD5 uh, hash just using a, a GPU uh, in, in the cloud. So we measure the strength of our hashing method by its strength against collisions. Is it possible to create valid content with, uh, with the same uh, hash? And SHA-1, as we'll find, is teetering on the brink. So we're advised not to use SHA-1 in terms of digital certificates and so on, because Google managed to create a hash collision within a reasonable amount of time for, a, I think it was a PDF document. It took them a year and a half, and they engineered it. You can imagine the resources that Google have. But now, it's theoretically and practically possible to create a collision in SHA-1. So don't use MD5 ever, and try to avoid uh, SHA-1 uh, if, if you can. Then we'll look at the Windows hashes, the LMs and the NTLMs and see how they are actually are created. A few little benchmarks, how we can actually benchmark uh, the time it will take to crack uh, hashed uh, passwords, and then onto message authentication codes, and one-time passwords, or hash-based one-time passwords. And at the very end, we'll do a little bit on, uh, on Hashcat. So the tools we'll be using in the lab today are Hashcat, uh, John the Ripper, 
and we'll be using our, our Python uh, tools again uh, to be able to, and sorry, OpenSL uh, to, to be able to, to do that. Okay, so there's where we are. We're at week three, and we're focusing on week nine for our first test. So I'll get you prepped as to what will be in that test a little bit uh, nearer uh, the time, but we're just now just trying to learn all uh, the basic uh, principles. Next week we'll go on to public key encryption and then key exchange uh, and those five <coughs> units really will provide uh, the core of our test in, in, in week nine. Okay. The other units that we do in between uh, for, for digital certificates, blockchain, future crypto and so on, they will lead <coughs> into uh, the second test. Each test will 25%. Of, of the mark, and then we have our coursework for 50% overall. Does anybody have any questions about what we're doing and where we're going and what we need to study? Good. Okay. So, what's a hashing method? Now, what we really want to do is to take any amount of data, uh, and that data is typically in bytes. Okay, we don't take bits or Metals. We take bytes, bytes at a time. And what we want to do is to create a method, a hashing method, so that we create a, typically a fixed length output for a hashed value. And this hash value hopefully won't be repeated again um, for any other data. Obviously, that is impossible. It's not possible for you to create a unique hash value from one byte to a zeta, zeta, zeta byte, and so on. So we've got to create enough hashes to make sure that it's almost impossible to find another hash for the same amount of data. And especially if it relates to something as important as a document. Is it possible to create two documents that have the same hash value? So we measure that with the number of bits that we have, and for MG5 it's 128 bits, <coughs> so we have 2 to the power of 128 different uh, hashes. That might, not, that, that might seem a lot, but with a, with a, a, a reasonably uh, fast computer, it's certainly possible to, uh, to search for up to 72 bits. So our challenge really is to see if we can take our uh, hashed, our, our data, and then to hash it down. And that allows us to be able to fingerprint that the, that the data has not been changed. If we find that somebody even changes one bit of data, then the hash signature should actually change completely. There is another area called similarity hashes. And it's an area of research. And similarity hashes gives you a hash that looks kind of the same. If I change one little bit of data, then a similarity hash will tell me how similar this hash is uh, as opposed to, to an, another one. Okay, so what's the different types uh, that, that we have? So it was uh, Ron Revest uh, created the MD5 signature, and this allowed us to take some data and to create a, a fingerprint or a, or a, or a hash signature uh, for, for the data. So with MD5, it's 128 bits, or how many X characters? Obviously, there's less when we come to V64. Uh, so with each each uh, each value, we'll get hopefully a unique uh, fingerprint for it, and we define that typically in V64 or or in hexadecimal. And you can see that even just a single change of a character completely changes the hash signature. 
In fact, if we change one bit in the input, we should see lots of bits changing. So these hashes have been designed to make sure they maximize the permutation of the bits. A single bit in should show at least half of the bits on the output changing in some sort of way. Because there, are, there, are, there can be weaknesses for that. Then SHA-1 was created with 160 uh, bit. But as I said, uh, Google cracked uh, this and showed that it was practically possible to, uh, to create the same uh, hash signature for SHA-1. Again, it's a longer one. In this case, how many text characters do you think we'll have? 40. 40. So it should be 40 uh, hex characters there. So Hashcat kind of knows that and it counts the characters and says, hmm, I think that's SHA1 because <laughs> of the characters. But there are other contenders for it. sha one's quite easy to pick off. MD5 uh, 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 Hashcat might have problems because other, other methods the same uh, length of hashes in, in there. Okay, and we can see all we need to do is to change a single character within size uh, data, and it will completely change uh, the hash value. If you remember back, we have multiples of four, so if we don't have a multiple of four at the end, we always put the, the equals to pad it out uh, from, from there. You can see it happening in this one too. So we often use uh, OpenSSL uh, for, for this, uh, and OpenSSL supports uh, most of the, the hashing methods, uh, but you'll find in uh, Kali and, and in Ubuntu, we can also use MD sum to be able to find our uh, hash uh, value. Okay, so here's an example here, and you pipe your file. Remember you've got hidden characters there, you've got new lines, Every character matters, so although you might not see the characters, actually having a new line in a file actually affects the, the hash uh, value. So make sure it's clean when you when, when you create it, and then make sure you check your hash values. Okay, so we can we can uh, fingerprint in, in that way, and we often use hashing in terms of integrity checking. So Windows will keep a, a store of all the MD5 hash values, and then if they change, then the operating system knows that something has modified them. There's an, an additional extra thing, and that Microsoft would sign that hash. We'll cover it next week. Microsoft would sign the hash with its private key, and then you would know that was a valid Microsoft-derived uh, signature for that, uh, for that file. Okay, we'll see it also. There's, these are digital certificates. And whenever your computer reads in a digital certificate, say you visit an Amazon.com, uh, it reads it in, and the one thing it's got to do is know that this is a valid Amazon uh, certificate. So the last thing that you want is for a fake certificate to be created, and then uh, for you to have, for it to be a fake uh, site. So within site a certificate, you'll see there's the thumbprint here. So when the whole certificate is read in, uh, the system will check the thumbprint uh, at, at, the, at the end of it. In this case, we're using a SHA-1 uh, hashing method. So when we take the whole certificate and create our own thumbprint, it should match what's on the certificate, and that's been signed by uh, an entity who you trust. And we see uh, pass, we see hash values in many places. In, uh, in Windows, old Windows systems, we had what's called an NT, MD4 on an NT uh, hash value, pretty bad <laughs> by today's standards. Uh, but it was basically just a hash of, of a password uh, stored in the Windows Hive. And we also see it on Cisco devices. So we see here. Uh, please never do this. 
this is MD5. Uh, this here is an MD5 encoded uh, hash value. And as we'll see, MD5 remains a completely insecure uh, hashing method. In this case, uh, we can actually see the salt. I'll explain this in a little minute. Between the dollars. Okay, there's the salt, there's the hash value. It's not, and the salt tiny, tiny little bit of salt. Uh, we take the salt, we take a dictionary list, and then we can pre compute to be able to try and find the same uh, hash value. And the thing is that that's the admin password for the whole of the Cisco device. If possible, try to use uh, encryption rather than hashing for uh, this type of uh, encoded uh, password. Okay, so the biggest problem is that it should be mathematically <coughs> impossible to reverse back where you are to here. Well, that's not possible to go from a hash value back to the original data. But what we can do is that we can pre-compute uh, lots of different common passwords and then work out what the hash value is. And we then have some sort of tree that we can very quickly search that tree for a given hash value and then reverse it back. So this is what happened with, uh, with uh, rainbow tables. So it's possible to preload uh, John the Ripper with a uh, rainbow table. And then all John had to do was to go through all the hash values and, and find uh, the right one. And there are optimized ways to do that. But now we tend not to do that. Now we have a salt and we run through a dictionary. We take a salt value, we take the dictionary, and then we, we compute until we find uh, the right hash. If that doesn't work, what, what can we do? So if a dictionary doesn't, doesn't work, what does that call that? Is it brute force? So we go from A, 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 to Z, 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 and, and so on. And we would work through each of the values. Possibly we want to start at eight A's and end at eight Z's, because we know there's mainly eight character passwords in, in, in there. So we can target exactly the brute force that, uh, that we're actually uh, looking at. And uh, there's been a lot of unfortunate cases. Do you know what the biggest hack ever was? Passwords. Hash passwords. Yahoo, yeah. Can you remember how many? Um, three billion. Three billion, something like that. I think it might be even more than that. That's, that's kind of a lot. And it's kind of a lot because people tend not to be using different passwords. So once they've got your Yahoo password, then it's a jump off point for lots of different types uh, of, of accounts. So I, uh, I've been pawned sites keeps a record, so make sure you go there and have a look to see if your password is in there from, from the past. Uh, do you know who, who runs that site? Troy, yeah, Troy Hunt. Uh, uh, ethically, <laughs> it's debatable, but it's a very powerful site for knowing that your password has been compromised, probably through LinkedIn or something in the past. And virtually every week we see a new uh, a new hack of, uh, of passwords. It happened with the Adobe hack. It was only 150 million, so it wasn't a big one. <laughs> but if you're one of those 150 million, then you've got to be worried. There was several things that were a problem. <laughs> For one, they didn't use salt. So once an intruder had cracked one hash value, they'd crack them all. So if you use the same password as someone else, it came out as the same hash value. But look at this. Two million people out of 150 million were so lazy that they selected one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> so, I mean, really, people are lazy and real lazy. 
I really just want to run an Adobe uh, package with that minimal hassle. The second most popular password was 1234567895, followed by passwords. Adobe 123, and you'll never guess this one, 1234567895. I'll just stop there. <laughs> you'll never guess that. So you can see that, uh, that people, even when they're forced to, to, uh, to have strong passwords, really uh, struggle from there. So there's a whole lot, and, and the big worry is, is having a, a, a jump off point. Okay, so if I have a seven character password from lowercase a to z, how many passwords are possible? seven characters. If I have one character passwords, how many possibilities are there for lowercase? Twelve digits. Was it? Twelve digits. I don't remember it. Yeah, th think, think it through. <laughs> you don't have to remember these things. What you need to remember is the is the method. If I have one character, 26. 26, yeah. Two characters? 26, 26. Yeah, 26, 26. So 26 to the power of 7. Okay? So that gives me my total number of passwords. If I want to now crack at 100 uh, billion per second, I can then uh, divide by 100 times 10 to the 9 and I'll get my total time to crack those. If I now take upper and lower case, I now have 52 to the power of 7. And if I take all of these, then that's 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 58, 60, 61, 62. 62 to the power of 7. So every time that we add on more characters, we will get uh, an increased number of, uh, of, of, pa of passwords. So if you look at our, our code, our simple uh, password coder, okay, so if we go for 100 billion per second, if we go for uh, lowercase, this is the number, this will be uh, 26. 54 seconds to crack every single uh, password there. If we now add uh, upper and lowercase, it now takes us up to seven hours. Remember, that's every, every one, <laughs> every password, every one with upper and lowercase in there. Now, if we ask and you add a numeric value, uh, we're still up at one and a half days to be able to search through every single uh, upper lowercase number. And then if we try with all those additional letters, then it's seven, seven days. And now up here, you're one and a half years. But remember, this is brute force, in that uh, uh, most of the time, a dictionary attack would, would work. And then if we add a number of processing elements, or if we even move up to terahash, we can see that nine character passwords with whatever you want, anything in it, every single password is cracked within one, one day. So 10 characters must be your minimum starting point, and it must be something that uh, isn't uh, guessable. Up here, we're still okay to 800 years uh, or so. But the way computing power has gone, maybe we'll get 10 terahashes. And maybe we might even get uh, that. But let's see what happens if I use bcrypt. <laughs> there you go. So bcrypt, look at this. Seven character password, 2,000 years. Uh, a 10 character password. That looks like 780 million uh, years. Okay, so watch when there's a data breach. 
If the company says that we use Bcrypt, then you cheer. And if they've used SHA, then you think that's a bad thing. Uh, and please articulate it if your company has a data breach and you've used Bcrypt or something like that, then you need to articulate to customers that their passwords are fairly well uh, protected as opposed to the other hashing methods that we saw. 200 hashes per second and your GPU will probably melt with its with its sort of processing in, in there. Okay, so so make sure you, you, you understand how to uh, how to uh, process uh, these these values and understand uh, strength. So there are various different methods uh, that we have. Uh, we start off with our our standard MD5 uh, hash value. Uh, we move up to SHA-1, 160 bits, and then SHA-2 is SHA-256. Okay, when I say SHA-2, SHA-256 is, uh, is this really the, the starting point, 256-bit uh, hashing value. And some people were worried that SHA will be broken in some way, so this created a new competition, just like they did for AES. And it was a SHA-3 competition. And uh, this one here, I, I, I always get a pronunciation. Does anybody want to pronounce it for me? Kitcha. What do we call it? Kitcha. Kitcha. Oh. <laughs> we'll call it SHA-3. That, that won uh, the competition. In fact, it was the same people uh, who had, uh, who had, who had uh, created um, the, uh, who had won with AES uh, forwarded that. But it's not the only show in town. Uh, Blake 3 is wiping the floor with uh, SHA 3 uh, just now. So, and a lot of people are using Blake 3 in terms of a lightweight crypto hash method. So, it's not an automatic one, but as we'll find, Ethereum uh, uses uh, SHA 3 for its, its hashed, uh, hashing. And there's a whole lot uh, that you can have a look at, uh, but Bcrypt is an excellent one and a very slow, very slow method indeed. There are also non-crypto hashes that are ultra fast. I think the XX hash is the fastest one around just now and it can do 10 giga hashes on a standard uh, CPU. So if you need ultra, ultra fast, there is really lightweight uh, methods uh, and FNB and Murmur are two uh, of the most popular. Uh, so this shows an example here of using a hashing method. So PBKDFS2 is a very popular key derivation function. So hashing methods are often used to derive an encryption key. I take a password, I then derive an encryption key of a certain length. One of the slowest around is PBKDFS2. When you connect to the Wi-Fi, it's PBKDFS2 that's actually protecting your password uh, or your, your, your keys. In this case, we have an encrypted drive. This is a true crypt. And what happens is that the actual symmetric key for the disk is protected through the key derivation function. So the user puts in their username or their password or the encrypted disk. It will pop off the salt. It will generate a key. That key opens up the header of the disk and reveals <coughs> the symmetric key that you can now use uh, to, to decrypt. So to decrypt, 99.9% of the market for encrypted disks is what? What has a virtual monopoly on encrypting disks? BitLocker. TrueCrypt, <laughs> it's got a tiny little bit, it's hanging in there. Uh, the people who created it actually left <laughs> or were maintaining it. Uh, and I think it, it, it was set up in a repository in Switzerland, and there are people now developing it. Uh, VeraCrypt 
is the new one. Uh, when I used to get exam papers, I would get, I would send my public key to a uh, university. They would encrypt with two crypt, I would get back and I would decrypt with my with my, with my private with my private key. Okay, so we, we also use hashing methods uh, to be able to <coughs> uh, generate keys. And the Python code that you've had in the labs, you probably find we've used SHA-256 to take a password and then generate uh, an, an encryption key from there. So an important thing that we have is what's called salting. And we came across salting last week, where we salted our encryption values. And we do the same with uh, hashing methods. We add some sort of salt. So this shows uh, uh, a fairly typical uh, hash uh, storage value. And the dollars are important here. So the first dollar defines the type. And in this case, it's MD5. The second defines the salt, and then the third here defines the actual hash that we get. So when we read the hash, we need that value, and there's stacks of them. There's hundreds or thousands of different hashing methods. So Hashcat will typically read that value, and then it will say that's, that's MD5, and here I'm doing it here. I'm checking with OpenSSL if I use the salt of Fred with the password for MD5, I should get the same hash value. So when you log in, you put the password in, you, the system takes the salt, it then creates the hash value and checks it against the value that's stored uh, in, in, in there. Yep. How did I know that uh, one means MD5? I'll show you in a bit. <laughs> There are many, many different types. Each one has their own code. So one was just the first one that was created, and that was MD5. Uh, SHA-1 is 1,000, and LN is 1,400. I'll come back on to that. No, I can't remember the actual values, but uh, we'll have a look in a minute. OK, so, the, uh, so here we go. In, in, uh, in Linux, we uh, often store our usernames and passwords within the shadow file. So we can see here, in this case, there's one, there's the salt value in there, and there's the hash up to here. Okay, I check that by popping off the salt here, and then taking my password, which I think is Red Hat, and we can see here that Red Hat is the correct password because I generate the same hash value uh, from, from that. Okay, so we would often use OpenSSL to be able to do our checking of these things. What's the last value? This is the last value. Oh, that's, that's to do with your, your user ID and your group ID. That. That's, that's the username, that's the, the salt, the method salt, hash value, and, and these are the unique user ID on the system. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem with hashing is that eventually you will have a collision. A collision will mean that there are two different data values that will create the same hash value. That might not be a problem, because if you've got, say, an image, and you create some completely random data with the same hash, the person isn't going to be able to view the image uh, anyway. The biggest problem is when you have a full context or a similar context. Can I create a different image, a different Word document that says something different? but for them still to have the same uh, hash value. And that's the challenge. Can I create a digital certificate? And it happened with the, uh, the Microsoft Windows 10 certificate. Can I create a different digital certificate uh, that looks uh, valid? And the probability of a collision uh, 
the babies as what's called the birthday attack. So let me check. I, I'll, I'll see if I, I've got a 50 50 chance for this one. Okay. So um, the birthday attack means that um, the probability for a collision isn't quite what you would think in the, the full space. An example of it is, let's look at your birthdays. And I think it's a 50-50 chance that two of you have the same birthdays. Does anybody want to bet against me? No. Don't bet against me, it's <coughs> Professor. Okay, so I think it's 50-50. A class of 25 or so, I think the odds. If, if it was 60, I'd be 99.999% certain there be two people with the same birthday. Okay, so who's got a birthday in January? January is 6th. Okay, okay. February? March? 4th? 6th. I'm struggling. April? <laughs> September? 19. October? 27. Oh, no. <laughs> November? 12. Uh, oh, 26. Oh, no. December, please. Twice. 14. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I can, I can show you. If you're in a pub, okay? Okay, you probably get thrown out for being such a geek. But if you're in a pub and there's about 60 people there, okay, say 10 to 1, I'll give you, give you 10 to 1 odds that will be the same. Oh, no, 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 no way. And you will win. You, you will almost certainly, well, almost certainly win. Uh, just let me see uh, the calculation here uh, with the birthday attack. So uh, I think there's about 25... 30 people in here, uh, I kind of had a 70% chance of that to work and it didn't quite work, which is unfortunate. But if you've got a class of 60 people, the probability that uh, you've, there's only half a percent that you won't win, okay? So 10 to 1 odds are good odds for them. And if you've got a room of uh, 80 people, you're you are 99.99% certain. You will not lose. Even if you give 100 to 1, uh, give them 50 to 1, you are still going to win. Okay? So the birthday attack uh, is what's used to be able to reduce the space. Eventually, if I keep, if I keep uh, uh, adding data to uh, my content, eventually through the birthday attack, I'll find uh, a collision from there. <coughs> and it can be, too, that the, that the basic method is flawed I itself. Uh, so this was MG5. I think, and somebody with virtually no time on their hand, with too much time on their hand, found that if I just change a few of these uh, bit values, I can produce the same MD5 uh, hash signature. But it was Nat here who really showed the birthday attack. So he took uh, James Brown and Barry White. And that's James Brown, by the way, that's Barry White. <laughs> and he did it with three images. That was, this is just his first one. 
And 10 hours on the Amazon GPU cloud, it cost them less than a dollar. And he used the CUDA hashcat with the CUDA core uh, on there. And he, he created a, a, a collision. So images are pretty dumb. You can put in lots of bytes in there and you'll never see them. Use them for steganography. You can stuff bytes into it. You can change bits and so on uh, and hide things. So basically what he did was he just kept stuffing bytes into, into the, the files and obviously the files grow bigger so it's one thing to watch uh, and eventually you produce a, a, a collision from there. So it's not just uh, these you can do it. I can quite easily create uh, say putty.exe and another putty.exe that will run the same and have the same hash, sorry, they will have the same hash values, but one is an evil putty and one is a good putty. It just happens that I've stuffed bytes in my evil one to make it give me the same uh, hash, hash value. So there's a particular problem from there. So obviously one of the most used hashed password values is with our, our Windows uh, passwords. So this is what a, a user looks like on a Windows domain. You can put it in a cor corporate environment. We use a, a, a domain uh, identifier. Uh, this one here, and it defines the, uh, the user number. 500 is the admin, and 1,000 and above is for every user ID. So everybody's Every user is unique, and you identify the domain ID, subdomains, and so on. So if you look at your ID, that's how, that's how you get your rights in the whole domain, through that unique uh, ID. Uh, so they, the passwords themselves are either stored in the domain controller, uh, if it's a domain for setting up, and then uh, within the SAM, database within this hive here, uh, we actually have the, uh, the passwords uh, stored. So often one way is to boot up with the disk not from the operating system and our hive isn't, isn't, uh, isn't protected anymore and I think it's in the system 32 folder, in the system 32 config folder you'll find your hives in there. We can pop uh, that <coughs> file uh, off uh, from, from there. And then that gives us, uh, that gives us our output uh, hashes that, 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 that we have. Okay, so we can see here, here's a, a list that PW Dump uh, gives us here. And we're using John the Ripper uh, to basically just go through and the hash values there. And you can see here it's managing to find uh, the password of Napier uh, pretty quickly. And we'll look at how that uh, works in, in a little minute. Uh, the other one that we can use is off CAC. And off CAC we can load up rainbow tables and so on. It's more of a, a, a GUI than a command line uh, prompts uh, system. So biggest weakness that we have is through uh, hash crackers or typically Bitcoin miners as we'll find uh, Bitcoin miners are trying to find a hash value that's unique. If they can find that hash value they win and they get paid uh, in Bitcoins. So we'll get fairly extensive systems that are just full <coughs> of, uh, of uh, GPUs. Uh, this one here costs three dollars and it does 1.5 tera. Tera, that's blistering. So that's 1500 giga or 1500 billion ashes per second. It's a massive throughput. It will crack virtually every single uh, password that you can think of up to nine or ten characters in, in a relatively short amount of time. 
in this case here, an A character in TLM, uh, password is cracked in 5.5 hours, 3.5 billion passes per second. So this shows, uh, this is a special rig uh, that this company uh, creates. Uh, if you think about it, that's the wire line here. Anything, anything this side is easily crackable. So if we take, let's say we take uh, SHA-256 here. SHA-256, character length of 8. <coughs> 45 minutes. 45. Eight characters, 45 minutes. For every single SHA-256 uh, SHA for a password of nine, three days. And, okay, that's taken us nine months. <coughs> okay, you see there's a big jump there. But uh, if you want that, then that might not be a long time. <laughs> an adversary to, because you'll get there in half the time probably, or you might be uh, very lucky. So you can see, uh, bad, 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 getting better, getting better, getting better, uh, quite good. Okay, so some of these ones up here, uh, TrueCrypt, uh, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin uh, the last thing you want is your Bitcoin wallet to be cracked. <laughs> So uh, Bitcoin, not too bad. Uh, make sure you use uh, uh, that's 59 years for an eight character. Uh, with this, this will cost you a fortune in electricity and to buy this 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 rig. Okay, so each of them, and you see even there's the there's the crypt. <coughs> crypt is a very slow. Uh, although it's SHA, it's it's crypt. Crypt has a number of rounds in it goes around, a, say, a thousand rounds. So for every one hash, it's got to do a thousand uh, of, of those. So we add in more and more. There's PBKDFS2 there. Uh, Decrypt is in there. Crypt. These ones, uh, this is a kind of more uh, encryption methods. There's, there's Bcrypt there. Bcrypt is probably the best that you're going to get. So even Bcrypt, Bcrypt with eight, eight characters is 18 months. With nine characters is 1.8 million years. I can assure you, you'll be dead. <laughs> By the time you crack that, you'll be gone. Won't matter. Be embarrassing for you, but you'll be one million years away, so you won't care that that much. And humankind won't exist anyway. It'll be all AI and uh, robots and stuff like that. Okay, so that shows you the the variation that we get. And I'll show you how we can do that. I love up here. Ah, there we go. That's a, that's a long time. <laughs> that's a million. That's big. Okay, so we, the hashing methods go from very fast to very slow. And typically when we create them, we want them to be really fast and optimal and run on lots of devices. But that's bad because we can crack these easier, because we can use these GPUs to crack them. So it gets a bit better here. Uh, these are about a tenth of the speed here. MySQL is a bit better. And these are the really slow ones. And these are the ultra slow ones. In fact, if you want, you can get a hashing method that breaks a GPU. And you think you can break a GPU. You don't actually physically break it, but how do you think you can break it? Overheat. Was it? Overheat. And you could overheat it, that's a good thing. It's difficult to, because they've got protection and stuff like that in there. There's one called Balloon that does that, helps you at all. <coughs> it's a method called Balloon. It tries to fill the GPU's little memory. So the GPU, each core has only got a little bit of memory, and you can use a hashing method that makes sure that it will overflow and, and it struggles. It's got to cache. So these are the really slow ones, Bcrypt API1, used in uh, Apache uh, Linux. Uh, there's Des Oracle, is pretty good, PBKDFS2. But each of these can be engineered to be as slow as you want. If you want a hashing password to take you 10 seconds to compute, you can do it. Okay? It's just going to be very costly and, 
and your users are going to have to wait a long time to get their password uh, checked. But at least an intruder will take 10 seconds to try just one uh, password. Okay, so it's, it's important. What I've done here, and at the end of the lab, I've got a little Python script that allows you to print out every hashing method that I could, I could find. And this is what they all look like. And Hashcat knows all these different formats and it can make a good guess. The basic hashes don't have any salt in them. Uh, first one here is bcrypt. 2a identifies bcrypt. The salt value then uh, is after that. And 05 gives the number of rounds that it, that it actually has. So some of them, to make it more and more difficult, they will have a round value uh, to make it uh, difficult to, to compute. The larger that value, the more difficult, and it's like an exponential uh, type thing. Okay, so just try to find one. There's PDP DFS2, uh, and, and so on. Okay, and this is all to do with the quick brown fox. Uh, what's special about the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog? That's what everybody, That's what everybody uses. <laughs> okay, so as a, make sure you benchmark uh, your uh, action effort. So hopefully that link will take us to that. Okay, so if I just try, uh, so. If I benchmark that, we'll see how long it takes me. So there's the there's the hashes there that I, I produce. Um, we can see here the murmur hash is ultra fast. LM hash very slow, and NT hash uh, much faster, but still pretty slow compared to uh, SHA one and these other ones. Des slow, bcrypt very slow, APR one. So it's these methods here that you probably want to be using for your, for your hashed passwords to make sure when an intruder gets the hash values, it's going to be very costly to crack that because they can only do 291 uh, hashes uh, per, per second in, in this case. <coughs> okay, so uh, that's that example. So the other thing that we have with uh, hashing is that we create what's called a message authentication uh, hash. And with this, we create a secret key between Bob and Alice, and then we have a certain hashing method that we're going to use. So let's say it's HMAC MD5. What happens is that this secret key is then used to encrypt that hash value so at the other end, uh, Alice just takes the secret key and decrypts the, the, the HMAC. What does she do next? So Bob takes the message, he finds the hash of the message, he encrypts with the secret key, creates the HMAC, and then at the other end, Alice decrypts with the shared secret. Maybe that's what they had, the key that they had at the start of the conversation. What should she do now? Recalculate. Is it? Recalculate that? Yeah. Code. So she'll, she'll recalculate the MD5 for that, and she'll check it against what she could do up there. And in that way, she knows the message has been changed, but what else does she know? Yeah. So Bob has not been a hijack attack here, uh, but uh, uh, Eve comes in and sends, Eve kicks Bob off and then hijacks the session and keeps sending. Because in this case, Eve won't have that secret key that they both uh, share, so uh, she won't be able to, to, uh, to create the correct HMAC. Uh, signature from, from there. Another thing that uh, is happening increasingly is that we're using one-time passwords. 
And really the whole concept of passwords has got to go. A PIN number and an SMS message and your fingerprint is probably a much better way than having to remember bigger and bigger uh, passwords uh, from, from there. So with a one-time password, what we do is we take a message or your password, we hash, 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 and every single time the next hash that's required, only you will know it because only you know uh, the original source uh, uh, pass password. So in this way you can pre-compute a whole lot of hash values, starting there. So the next time you use that one, next time that one, and then that one. And it's not possible for Eve to work out what these hash values will, will be. We can also get a timed uh, password. In this case, the hash value will only be relevant for, say, five seconds. So every single time, it will time out. Does that ever use two-factor authentication on their, their phone? I use it extensively for virtually all of my logins. Uh, so I've got to go to my phone and I'll get my codes that will only be valid for maybe 30 seconds or so. I, I highly recommend you put that on all of your sites if, if you can. Uh, it's not perfect because obviously if you lose your phone, you might be struggling a little bit, but there's ways around uh, that. But with that, you'll get a one-time code. The one-time code will, will relate to that, uh, that specific time. And then we can get a one-time counter uh, password uh, in there. So I'll just show you an example of that, hopefully. From here. If I can find it. Uh, so this is a one-time password. So I, you generate a seed initially. So if you have a Ubi key or something like that, uh, you'll see a lot of people, and again, I highly advise you in a highly secure environment, use a USB key. I think today Google released new software for a hardware key. Uh, Apple are pretty good, so your, your Apple Watch has got to be there. Some wearable device is likely to be the future in this type of thing. But we generate a, a new key, and then each time I can generate, uh, this is the counter method, I'll generate a new key, and it's not possible within the time limit of these to be able to work out what the next one uh, will actually be. So I can go for a timed one. So I've set this to be uh, five seconds, I think. Okay, one, two, three, four, five there, one, two, three, four, five. There. So it, it only generates a new one uh, every so many seconds. So you can set it to have as many time uh, length as, 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 you, as you want. And uh, Google Authenticator uses uh, this method to be able to generate your, your hashed value for you. And it shouldn't be possible to guess what that's going to be within inside the time limit that's actually a set. I think it's about 30 seconds as a typical time. It just gives you enough time to get your phone up uh, and, uh, and do that. So please use two-factor authentication, especially for Amazon. You do know that if you have Amazon, AWS, if somebody gets access to your, your, your account, you can have lots of problems. <laughs> because all your servers are stored there, all your keys are in there too, and somebody can spin up uh, images and run away with your, your credits from there. Okay, so that's the, uh, we can also do it with a hash value, and there, generate a new seed, and then this will give us a, a counter value, and we could ask for a certain counter value what the code uh, actually, actually is. And in this case, we can make our can generate our seeds. Oops, should be better. From there, and only knowing the original seed can you actually work out what the sequence of the hash values will actually be. Okay, so we'll have a break and then we'll look at uh, hash cards and I'll give you some demos and we'll have a little test uh, after.
after that. Okay, right, so just five minutes. Right. Okay. So in the in the lab today, uh, we'll be using uh, OpenSSL uh, to analyze our hash values, and then we'll be using Hashcat to be able to see if we can crack a range of uh, hashing uh, methods. And we'll find it often isn't that, that difficult to uh, to crack through uh, Hashcat. So Hashcat gives you uh, a number of uh, different options. Uh, you can have uh, pre-prepared rules uh, that you can actually find, such as uh, only making the first letter upper or lowercase, adding a number onto the end. Uh, we can go for dictionary attacks, where we can pre-populate uh, a whole list of uh, common words, and then get it to go through that. And then in the end, we can do a brute force uh, and attack uh, for, 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 uh, for that. Okay, so generally, it's fairly simple. We've got a hash file, and then we can actually add on uh, a, a word file uh, in there. So this shows an example of, uh, of cracking an MD5. These are MD5 hash uh, values in there, and with and uh, what list that we want uh, it to go through. Uh, the minus n or hash type, we have a number in there, and that relates to one of the numbers that's for the methods that we talked about uh, earlier uh, from there. We can also run a benchmark on our system uh, to make sure that we understand how many hashes it's going to go through and how long it's going to take us. We'll give you an indication that if this is an eight character uh, password for MD5, it's going to take three days uh, for, for, for brute force. So it, it does, it takes an estimate uh, of, of, of that. Okay, so those are the, the basic modes that, that we actually have for our, uh, for our uh, attack mode with the minus uh, A in, in there. Okay, so the, the, the value that we put in there relates to the different hash types. So there's a script there, which is uh, 8900, SHA-1 is 100, uh, and, and so on. And then we can, we can very quickly uh, benchmark uh, from, from there. Okay, so I'm going to benchmark uh, uh, MD5. Uh, so it's, this is running in a virtual machine uh, on my processor, so it's obviously going to be show, slower than running at uh, bare metal from there. So you can see in this case, we're, we can get 180 mega hashes. So this is a Mac running uh, VMware, and it's still able to, to uh, uh, crack 180 mega hashes from there. So we pick off our type that we want. Uh, so in this case it's NTLM, so we'll see what NTLM works, and that's actually even more. So for a Windows type, or an older Windows hash, it's 341 uh, mega hashes uh, per second. But if we went for something like uh, Bcrypt, then we'd probably find that would be ultra slow. <coughs> and we find our type here, so we just need to go through and find the number that we're looking for. So there's, a, there's SHA-3 Sha, Sha uh, that we saw before. Uh, Whirlpool, this the MD5 ones. Uh, SHA-1 is, is 100. So if we tried 100 here, uh, we should be able to see how fast SHA-1 is compared to to that, and it's pretty similar to MD5, probably even a little bit uh, faster. So a lot of these hashing methods were designed to be fast and secure. Uh, and obviously what we want typically is for it to be fairly slow. If I can find uh, some of the slow ones. So tell me a slow one. 
slow, slow method. Uh, and uh, there's LM, NTLM. Can you see bcrypt 3200? I know it's difficult to see the screen there. So we'll try 3200. And this is for bcrypt. And it's 1246 hashes uh, per second. So that's about 100 times. Thousand, a thousand times slower than our SHA-1. So our SHA-1 was given as 134 mega hashes per second. Now we're 1.2 kilo hashes. That's a thousand, at least a thousand times slower for bcrypt. And we can actually make it even slower if, if we want. So that's going to be very costly to go through a, a big dictionary if I can only crack a thousand uh, per, per second. Okay, so the, so the, the method uh, matters from there. Okay, so typically what we would do is to, is to have a list with all our hashed uh, values, and we'll do that in the lab today. We then define our shortlist, our little dictionary, and then it'll go through each of the, the dictionary terms in here, and in this case, I'm going to do hundreds, which is, can somebody see what that method is from there? Uh, is, it, is it NT, NT11? And you can see there it's managed to crack it. One thing to watch in the lab is that once it's cracked it, it doesn't give you it again. It stores its, uh, it stores its cracked values in, in a in a file which is hidden on your top level. So if you want it to, to go through again, you've got to erase that file. Uh, there's a pot file, uh, I'll show you in, in the lab, but if I was to run this again, it would show help being, being cracked. So make sure that you erase that, those files for, for John the Ripper and also for Hashcat, uh, or it won't show you them Again, with John the Ripper, you can use the minus minus show option and it will show you what you've got before. But with Hashcat, it won't repeat what you've already uh, cracked uh, from, from there. Okay, and the good thing is that it'll actually tell you how many it's tried and uh, how many permutations that it, uh, that, that, it, that it went through. Okay, so there's, there's another example uh, in there. And we could do lots of different things, like having two dictionaries. We think our password was a bit of this and a bit of that. <laughs> Maybe where you live and something else. You can take two different uh, files together and then merge them together as to, to create your, your, your word list. But at, but at its core, uh, it uses the brute, brute force method to, uh, to, 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 to attack the, the the pass the the passwords, and you can focus on your character set. So what you might do is uppercase, lowercase, 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 because you know that it's an uppercase, and then the rest are all lowercase. So you might go for uppercase, lowercase, and then a, a numeric value at the end. So you can target it with either lowercase. Uppercase, uh, decimal, uh, all these string values, uh, and, and, and so on. And that way you can build up quite uh, complex rules uh, for, for that. Okay, but for brute force, if we take, uh, say, the lowercase, we're going to go from uh, all A's all the way to uh, all Z's in terms of, uh, of, uh, of cracking the... Uh, the, 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 the password. Got a very example there. Okay. So in this case, we're going to take our 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 character uh, password. And in this case, we're looking for all uh, lower cases. So it will go from 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 8 in this case. There's an option if we just want to target. 8, it just goes straight in for 8, 
but in this case it will go through. As you see here, 26, 676 is your number from your Mentimeter. From there, it's went through the whole lot, it hasn't found any. It then goes to oral A's, TA's, DZ's, uh, and, and so on. It eventually found one uh, in, in here. Well, that's, that's the progress. So Hashcat will often, you, you leave it running, and it'll tell you where it is with, uh, with, with that. Okay, so it's important that you look uh, here uh, to see the, the number of, the number of uh, values, because that's going to tell you how long it's going to take uh, to actually run uh, that, uh, given uh, your, <coughs> your, your setup. Okay, and if I kind of know, I kind of know that it's HEL and it's something, then we can just target one letter here. So in this case, it's going to go through and then try uh, just the A, A to Z uh, in there. And hopefully eventually uh, it's recovered it and it has recovered it uh, from, from there. Okay, so we can... Uh, so with brute force, this shows an example of how we can get a whole lot of, uh, of hash values. In this case, that file has this hash value here, and you can see that it's actually found a, a, a numeric value. So this would only take us 10 uh, searches as opposed to, to maybe uh, searching with uh, A to Z. Okay, with our rules list, uh, we can, if you look at the the rock you uh, list. So rock you is just one example of a complete list of common uh, passwords. Uh, so those are things like that. I appreciate that's not the type of passwords that I use uh, now uh, from there. But we can actually bring in our, our list uh, from here and then see if we can match uh, against uh, that. So I should be able to show that. Uh, so there's a there's a uh, a list that was taken from the battlefield uh, game. If I can find my VM. Okay, so if I just show you, uh, that that's just a few of the of the hashed uh, passwords that that were used that uh, pe that users <coughs> used. Uh, on that game, and then if I show you just the the rock U, then of course one two three four five six three at top and so on. Uh, there's massive amounts of these uh, passwords in there. And it'll just keep going on and on uh, from from there. So these are ordered in terms of uh, popularity. So obviously, if we put the most popular ones at the at the top then it's more likely to hit them. And then the ones you're getting here are, are probably less, less common. So there's, there's an ordering system that's uh, been used uh, here. So these are getting quite complex now. Uh, but you can see at the end, I've actually even got spaces in, in them uh, in there. So these are the less common ones, uh, but this is just a small, small data set. You can actually use uh, larger ones uh, from in there. Okay, so... Uh, they're MD5, so they're not great. Okay, we wouldn't be using MD5 these days. But just to check, we'll run Hashcat from there. So it's got a oh, bang. There you go. It's just phenomenal the, the speed uh, that we've got in there. And I think that's them all. That's them all uh, cracked uh, from in there. Even the ones like uh, uh, dot fifty caliber. Is, is is in there so it's managed to get all of these ones within just a a, a short a short time <coughs> okay so we would we would obviously test against standard uh, uh, lists from them and then the rules themselves as we've seen there are up and lower case uh, but we can actually build fairly complex ones like appending uh, strings onto other ends and pre-prending uh, and, and, and so on. And along with that, there are predefined rules that are already 
set up that uh, are, are, are well used in, in systems. Okay, so that uh, we could start off with pa these passwords and we can end up with uh, ones that, uh, that are then pre-processed. So this one here, we'll put a numeric value uh, on, on, to the, on to the end if, if we want. And then from there. Okay, so another rule is to be able to capitalise uh, certain characters so we could focus on the first uh, value uh, from there. Uh, or we could uh, modify our input so that an I becomes a, a 1. In this case, in Edinburgh, I becomes a 1 in there. And then we can look to prepend 1, 2, 3 uh, <coughs> numeric values at the end. Again, all these substitution ones that that we often use to substitute a 5 for an S. Does anybody use another one that isn't there that you're willing to tell us? And a 3 for an E. Who uses that one? No one? Who uses a, a 0 for an O? No one? Yeah, a few. <laughs> uh, so we've probably all been there at, at, at one time. Okay, so there's the example that I, show, uh, I showed you uh, earlier. So in the lab today, what we'll be doing is to, to be able to I'll give you uh, hashed values and then you've got to try and work out uh, the, uh, the hashed from, from there. Uh, when you're looking at these hashes, if I can just find where we are. Okay, so when you look at your hash value, this gives you the method, this gives you the salt, and this gives you the hash value. Remember, here, that's different. That's, uh, M that's MD5. So just don't always assume. When we use OpenSSL, uh, we take the salt value, which you'll get from here. <coughs> you'll take the password, and then hopefully you'll generate the same uh, value as, as we have uh, there. Okay, so we've got a, a number of uh, different different challenges uh, for you uh, for that. Okay, does anybody have any questions on what we've done? It should become more apparent when we do this in, in the lab. Uh, the lab will probably take about four hours uh, to do, so you've got two hours in the lab and probably another two or three hours uh, additionally uh, from there. Right then, so just get your phones out and we'll give that a little try to see how much you've, you've, uh, you've learned. Nine five zero nine zero one. Okay, mentimeter.com and it's nine five zero nine zero one. You can use it on your laptop on your mobile device. I think there's one a bit later that probably needs a laptop, but we'll see how we get on. Okay, everybody connected? 14. Everybody signed the register, by the way. Right. Nearly all connected? Good. Okay, so give yourself a name. Star, the more points you get. Uh, just to recap from last week, if you remember, which is not a symmetric key encryption method. Kind of helps what we did this week too. And it's MD5. MD5 is a hashing method that we talked about today. RC2, AES, 3DES, RC4 and Blowfish are all symmetric key encryption methods. Please learn that. <laughs> okay, so let's see how we got on. Bob didn't do so well there. Bob, where are you? Where are you, Bob? Did you get that one? Did you got that one, but you're just not there. Okay, sure, sure. To do with quantum computers cracking the public key encryption. Good. 
and Magic X. Okay, the next one. Which is not a hashing method. So for all the methods I did, MD5, SHA1, SHA256, NTLM, PPK, DFS2 or SHA NTLM. It's a bit kind of detailed this one, isn't it? Oh, oh, oh I think I've won this one. <laughs> SHA, MD5 is a hashing method. Do you want me to say it a million times? <laughs> MD5 is hashing. SHA1 is hashing. SHA256 hash, NTLM is a Windows hash, PBK TFS2 is a hashing method. Many times they have to say it. <laughs> it's a slow hashing method. And SHA NTLM is the right answer. So let's see how Bob got on there. Oh, Scott. Scott did well there. Tycon. Oh, oh not, not so well. Who's Tycon? Who's Tycon? Oh, well done. And sure, did well there, pal. Scott, where's Bob? Where's Bob, how you get on, Bob? Is it not? It's not not working for you this week. <coughs> right, fastest gets most points. A hash gives the same result for a different output streams. Data streams is a collision, a perfect match, a symmetric key. Not possible can never happen, or an error in coding. It's a collision. Well done. <coughs> this was uh, oh, quite quite a few did well there. Still Tycon from look ty Tycon by a long way. Which hashing method has one hundred sixty eight bit one hundred sixty bits? MD5, SHA1, SHA256, SHA384, SHA512. <coughs> yeah, well done. Uh, how many bits has MD5 got? 128 bits. How many bits has SHA256 got? <laughs> and SHA512? 12, yeah. <laughs> 512. The, the clue's in the title, and uh, if there's a... So SHA-1, uh, 160 bits from there. Just at the limit of, uh, of being cracked. Uh, still still kite, it's Tycon in there. NOLA, Alien, L. Well there. Okay. 10 bit encryption key, if you remember from last week, how many keys are possible? 10, 1,000, 1,024, 4,096, or 16,000. I think we'll see a normal distribution here, or maybe maybe you get all this one right. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, 2 to the power of 10 is 1,024 uh, from there, and definitely not 100, that's for sure. Okay. Oh, L did well there. I think it's probably still Tycoon. Tycoon, or this? That's Tycoon. Ah, Tycoon, that's somebody with money. How many hex characters will a hashed MD5 password have? Ooh. Hurts your brain, this one. Too well done. That's excellent. Very impressive. Okay, I think this one will be a bit slower for you to do that one. Snowy Fox did well there. Where's Bob? Where where's Bob? Are you where's Bob this week? Or are you just you're just Bob? You've you've not appeared in the top Oh JD, who's JD? Who's JD? Okay, well done, right at the back. <laughs> Jammin. Is that reggae thing is it? Okay, and then where's Bob? Where is Bob? Come on, Bob. Okay, so for this one. For the creation of passwords in order to defend against dictionary attacks, which would be the most recommended method? 
MD5, SHA1, SHA256, PBKDFS2, or NTLM? Which is the best one there to protect? It's PBKDFS2. Very, 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 very slow method from there. Don't use MD5, definitely not. Or SHA, anything. Okay, uh, Jamin did well. Pint Man, Pint Man doing well. Who's, who's Pint Man? Not you. <laughs> oh, L is doing actually very well. Who's L? Well done. Yeah, Jamin, Tycoon, Shore. Uh, Shore's just dropped a little bit. Who's Shore? Oh, good. Okay, add salt to a hash password. Makes it impossible to crack, makes it resistant to rainbow tables, or makes it more difficult to check the password. And the answer is, makes it more resistant. Uh, it doesn't make it more difficult to check the password, because it's just the same operation that we would have. Uh, it certainly doesn't make it impossible to crack unless you lose the salt. Or maybe I should say that. Okay, so here we go. Scott, Pint Man. Pint Man's coming in well there. Uh, Snowy Fox doing very well. Tycoon not so well there. Still GD. Come on, Bob. Where are you? <laughs> if we lose the salt of a hash value, what will happen? I'll have to recompute different salt values. It will be impossible to cover the, recover the password. I should never store the salt with the password. Oh, oh, a bit of a difference here. And I'll have to recompute all of the different salt values. I'm going to have to go through. So the salt value should always be long enough to make it too difficult for somebody to recompute a random uh, salt in there. Uh, 64 bits is probably where you want to start. Uh, anything less than that, then, then you, you've, you've probably got problems in that. Still Pint Man doing very well there, but JD did extremely well there. L not so good. And Jammin is uh, is getting there too. Okay, come on Bob. Come on Bob and where's Bob? <laughs> if I use a character set of Boo Boo, how many two character passwords are possible? I appreciate that one's pretty close to it. Uh, it's not definitely not a billion, that's, that's for sure. And it's not 26, that's definite uh, from there. Okay, so only three people got that one. I feel a bit sorry for the, the other eight. They did pretty well there in estimating things. We'll see who did well there. Oh, JD by a long way. And maybe Bob's going to appear in this one? No? What, what position are you, Bob? And JD, JD one, who's JD? Oh, well done. You're generally top, uh, top, uh, all, all, all the way. Okay, so it's so in the lab uh, today. So uh, what you should find for the lab, the lab we've got answers. Please try to avoid look at the answers if, if you can, uh, and try to work your way through through the lab. Okay, well. Thanks, so hopefully uh, you now understand a bit more about uh, hashing uh, methods. Uh, you want to understand the core principles behind what goes on and uh, what the tools. Does anybody have any questions? Before we go? Okay. Uh, you, you've got a very nice column on the table, but I didn't see it in the deck. Uh, can we get that uh, with your line of worry? Is it, is it the, you didn't see that, that table in, in, in the, the, the PowerPoint slides? I, I'll push it to the GitHub. I know, I'll push it. Oh, you will? Okay. I will, I will. I just have a chat. I did that on the bus then, so I'll be careful. Okay, well, that, thanks, thanks very much, and uh, uh, I'll see you in a while. Okay.